Tomas, Chris, thank you so much for coming in. You're welcome. Uh, on, on, on the surface, this record is Phoenix. Um, on the surface, it's, it's a band from France writing about Italy. But I like this quote. Uh, this is from Laurent. He said the album is actually about, quote, a lost paradise made of eternal Roman summers, jukeboxes on the beach, fearless desire, and antique marble statues. What led the four of you to searching for an idyllic or a lost Italy? Um, boredom, first. Uh, and also the idea that we, every record is a, is a, f we treat it like a first record, each, each, each new one, you know, so we want to go in a new direction and, and, uh, and try to explore something new. But, uh, boredom has always played a, an important part, um, in terms of how, um, just pure motivation to get out of Versailles, you know. Do you get bored by your own music or do you Yeah, get... but I think personally by, by own, my own uh, voice. Yeah, you know? by uh, our uh, late, last record, we're always bored by it, you know. Really? Yeah. How long does it take you to get bored? Uh, after, when we, you know, uh, usually it takes us uh, one year, more than one year to be uh, really happy with the life when we tour, you know, mm -hmm. we always try to progress. Mm -hmm. And then at one time, we don't feel any uh, progression on our side. So it's just pure pleasure with the audience, but there's the boredom is going bigger and bigger. That's when we stop and we go back in the studio and we want to go as far as possible. And so this time we didn't predict anything. We, we just uh, wanted to experiment and, and yeah, to go far, far, far and, and some kind of, uh, Italy came to us, and this is this is this Italy grounded in any real experiences in Italy, or is it entirely? I'm half Italian, yeah, and my brother too, of course, and so we spent all of our summers in Italy. Mm -hmm. But I don't know where really it came from. Maybe we watch many Italian movies on the last tour mm -hmm. when we are far from Europe. We missed uh, Europe, you know. It's an it's an idealized version of of what yeah. Italy yeah. actually is. It's yeah. a fake one. It ha it has to be wrong. Otherwise, it's not really interesting. You know, uh, I think it's the same thing. We sing in English because we know we're coming up with things that are not authentic and, and uh, you know, they're slightly off, sometimes totally off. You know, they're they are awkward, but I think there's more charm or there's more, uh, something more unique that comes out of this distance and this distortion. Uh, uh, and it's the same with Italy that we use it uh, almost with, it's not really a tourist vision but it's a there's a distance you know there's a this idea of the lost paradise or something a fantasy mm -hmm. of something uh, another uh, an, uh, an uh, alternative I'm not sure if the word is ironic or coincidental but it, I was so struck by that because there is an entire medical syndrome based around people having I know you guys are from Versailles, but there's an entire medical syndrome based around people going to Paris yeah. And, yeah. and expecting one thing and then not... The Paris syndrome. People, people it's come, mostly Japanese people and that they come, experience that. And yeah. they come, if, if I'm not mistaken, they come and they have this, like you said, idealized, distant tourist version of what Paris is going to be. Yeah. And when, then when they get there, it's, it's not what they thought it was going to be and, and, they, and they can't handle yeah. it. I think there's a violence to it. Um, it has to be so violent um, that it, um, you know, it messes you up. And it's, uh, but yeah, there's a violence in beauty and there's a violence in how uh, you experience beauty and you also experience every day, um, you know, Paris can be rough, can be... Uh, every uh, time I see a Japanese uh, tourist in uh, in Paris, I want to yeah, to be uh, very gentle with Protective. them. Because you can see they are like, Ooh, they, it's not what they expected, you know. Right, But right. it's funny because there's another syndrome. It's called the Florence Florence syndrome. It's, but it's Stendhal. Uh, uh, yeah, Stendhal. Stendhal. Yeah, Stendhal. It's uh, the people, few people who are going to Florence. How do you say Florence? Florence. Uh, Florence. Oh, yeah, yeah, Florence. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
they become a bit crazy because they saw so so many masterpieces, you know. Of oh, art. the Stendhal syndrome. So they, yeah. they they see art that is so beautiful. Beautiful that yeah. they uh, you know there's a there's something after they cannot uh, you know. Uh, what does that tell you about how we perceive art? What does that What does that tell you? I think it's great. I think that's one of the strongest. Uh, that's something I want. I want to experience that uh, to be total, totally overwhelmed by beauty. That you know, it's not a shallow thing. That you know, it's triggering some part in your brain and your that uh, shuts you off. You know, for a second. Uh, that's the most powerful. Uh, I mean, when you listen to music, the first huge musical moments growing up. Um, they sh they they totally uh, change every single thing in you. Like mm -hmm. they, uh, like my bloody Valentine. We are just listening mm -hmm. to my bloody Valentine. And that's what's first time we listened to my bloody Valentine. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. it. I thought it was a mistake. You know, the, the it was broken. Yeah. You know? And sometimes you have to turn it off. I talked the other day on this show about the first time I heard She's Leaving Home by the Beatles. You know, this yeah. is from Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, this incredibly sad song. And I was so moved by it. And I thought it was so perfect that I turned it off. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't get through yeah. it. I couldn't I couldn't bring myself and sometimes you read I don't know if sometimes you read a book and and halfway through the book you just go, No, yeah, yeah. not right now. Like I can't. And it's yeah. not because you don't enjoy it. Nick Drake is like that for uh for me sometimes. Is that too, so? Yeah, it's too. Uh, it's just also you know what happened to him, and you know, and it's it's uh, yeah. I turn it off, yeah, because it's too, it's too much. I know this is such a positive record, and this is such a happy record, but I, I have to admit that when I was listening to it, knowing a little bit about the environment that it was made, I felt, I felt similar. I know, Chris, that they, during the attacks on the Bataclan, you were inside, and you were working on music. Yeah, not inside the Bataclan. But yeah, I should say you were inside yeah. a studio yeah, yeah, near studio, near the Bataclan. Far, yeah, that's 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 my my, yeah. my fault. Um, and I, I I in I hear this joy. Well, I also heard what this joy was perhaps a reaction to. Yeah, I, I, am I wrong there? No, no. Um, yeah, I mean, at first we were really surprised because, um, and we felt. Uh, a little disturbed by it, we felt like we were something was wrong with us, you know, that we didn't have any empathy or because we were making this very hedonistic, joyful, light and simple music. And outside it was really dark and gloomy and, and um, <clears throat> you could feel the tension and and um, it was in total contradiction with what everything everybody else was was doing. Everybody had to be you know, responsible and act, be a citizen and, and, uh, and, um, yeah. for us, we were the opposite. At, when know? we were, when, every time we were going in the studio, yeah, we were the opposite. But once we were out in the studio, it was totally uh, different. I can't imagine what that's yeah. like. So, so yeah, we, we didn't control it, but we just needed in a subconscious way to go as, you know, to brighter, brighter, Spirits, you know. Well, and Chris, you were in the studio when this happened. What, what, what did that moment of just being there change for you? Uh, it, it was uh, far. I don't. Uh, it was uh, all Parisians, uh, you know. I was not that far, but so yeah. No, it, it was a uh, yeah big tension, a big. Uh, but yeah, we music was uh, a way to uh, yeah to to what to. Uh, <laughs> I don't, to, uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, it's very uh, hedonistic, but you can feel uh, the melancholy, something darker behind, of course, uh, well, the music we are doing. Well, there's there's also defiance. There's defiance in being joyful at a time where you're made not to feel joyful. Um, yeah, I think that's something that's specific to our band too. That we like, you know, coming from Versailles. You have to be uh, in that mode. You have to. What do you mean? Um, Versailles is a museum city. You know, mm -hmm. everything's there. Everything great that existed happened already. So people are very conservative. They want to keep it the way. You know, if you make music, you, you're disturbing the peace of the museum. So you have to be defiant. You have to create some sort of noise or at least. 
uh, reappropriate the environment so that you can exist, you know, so that you have, you can grab onto something because otherwise you're just part of the, you know, the global silence or the, so yeah, we had to um, come up with something so that, you know, we, we, we would find something interesting uh, there to do. Chris, well, what's the difference in playing in Toronto and playing in Versailles? What does it feel like when you have to actually play back there? Uh, we are actually, there, in Versailles, there's no <laughs> venue. You cannot play, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, when we played in Versailles, we played just for our, ourselves, you know. What do you mean? We played uh, just in the basement, Thomas' basement. So you ne you have never played a gig in Versailles? Two, I think, in the streets. You know, it's uh, there's a day, yeah. a national day in France, when yeah. it's the first... 21st of June, everyone can play in the street. Fête de la musique, it's called. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's the only... We played it twice. And once it was with Darling, the, the band, with Bronco, my brother, and the two guys from Daft Punk. Mm -hmm. So we played only two shows, you know. <laughs> so we, we never knew what it was like to play, you know, in front of uh, the audience. At mm -hmm. the but beginning two... of this tour, we tried to play. Yeah. There's a small place in Versailles. We said, we want to start the tour play like three shows to warm up for the for and the we, hometown we crowd could, we couldn't they wouldn't let us <laughs> <laughs> that's how loved we are there they wouldn't let us they said no there's uh but two days ago we played in toronto mm -hmm. and uh it was fantastic yeah. well yeah it's, i mean it's i see you in toronto and you yeah. play for this I exuberant crowd i just i'm i'm struggling with the fact that your hometown you can't yeah you can't get a gig play, no <laughs> i want to point out that if you don't know this band this is a band that plays for tens of thousands of people more all around the world if you're listening to this in versailles for some reason open a bar let them play <laughs> let let them do a show we'll we'll, we'll sponsor it um I, I just want to go back briefly. I don't want to harp on it, but I'm, I'm so interested in what positive music... We talk about the actual impact of art. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about these days is whether art has any impact at all, maybe at my most cynical. Yeah. I worry... I have a friend of mine, I've quoted this in the show a number of times, in, in, who's a music professor in uh, British Columbia, who says that to him the only noise that can make you do anything is a siren because it makes you pull over your car. Ultimately, sound can't do anything. And that's something that that's, that's st stuck with me. I'm trying to figure out at a time where we're making music that is positive in a time of negativity or is critical in a time of great corruption. Do you think that, that music does have a role in, in darker times or in times of tragedy? Yeah, I don't agree. I mean, I'm not sure what, how, in what context he said that, but uh, music... I, you know, uh, more than the siren does something to me. You know, if you want to be very technical, a phone ringing that does something. But uh, <laughs> but but music in general, harmonies, chords, they are, you know, they are they are drive like Chris. If he hears, he's walking on the street. He hears like a band playing, like maybe like four streets away. He's gonna reroute and go that way mm -hmm. and that's going to change his day and he's going to stay there forever and I'm going to be like I love we need to, to go mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, even bad bands I love mm -hmm. yeah. well bad music's better yeah, than bad. no music yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. it's mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. but yeah so that's that's uh, you know, sound and music has a huge I think it's, it's it has a magnet effect or something there's a, there's a and, at, and, at, and at a time like this it can be it can be useful yeah, I think it's always useful. I mean, um, also it's it's very what I love and how we grew up listening to music is that music was not dictating how you are supposed to feel. You know, my favorite songs could be sad or happy, uh, depending on how I felt. But I would see them uh, with a different, and so a lot of these um, memories that are attached to. Uh, Growing up listening to music are uh, these mixed emotions and mixed feelings, and that trigger you. You can go one way or the other, except maybe for Nick Drake, that's just, just full on sad. That's sad all the time. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a huge. Um, it has a huge impact for it. Yeah. I and and it's funny you mentioned that in that when you said there's some melancholy, Chris. When you said there's some melancholy on this new Phoenix record, I also heard that. I heard the same music, and depending on how I was thinking about it, I was either delighted and happy and joyful and I want to go out and party, 
or I was sad or I was I was I was seeing it as defiant. I was you're right, I was I was impacted by it. Yeah. I have one very technical question I wanted to ask you. Um we had a translator on the other day who, who translates Haruki Murakami's work, a great Japanese author, and he yeah. translates it from a J- Japanese into English. And the question I have for him is that when you've translated the last word in the short story or in the novel, that doesn't mean you're finished. You have to go back and read it over. You 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 make sure you did a good job. You make sure you captured the sentiment. I know from making records, just when you record a song, you have to then go back and listen to it and kind of st- step away. The fact that you guys write songs in such an interesting way, and in that you jam, and that you you create together improvisationally, and then you wean it down into something that we hear on the records. When do you know you're done? That's the question. You know, we were we were supposed we were in the studio. Uh, we were supposed to be there for a few weeks, and we stayed almost three years. You know. <laughs> So we actually we were like on what we did when we played, you know. The For example, the table, the <laughs> support the support table. Exactly we had with us <laughs> even bigger the that. one we had, a bit bigger, but we had many keyboards, microphones everywhere, and we played J Boy, for example, the one. We played it like this after one month or two of the recording, and we it took us almost two years and a half mm-hmm. just to find the last five percent, you know. Really? So it's a never, uh, and there's a song we, the last song we we did it in one afternoon from A to Z. You know, we did it. So there's no rule. That's the beauty of our uh, job. But I, th- I think we we are done when we are totally exhausted. I yeah. think that's hmm. that's maybe the only. Uh, we know a song is good enough to be on the record. When I see, I I know when I see and the three other members. You know the eyes lit up and the confidence, and that you're not vern- vulnerable anymore. If a friend comes up, comes in the studio, and you're, you know, you're just really proud, and it doesn't matter if he says that's a really bad song or that's a really good song. Mm-hmm. It's even better sometimes if he says it's a really bad song because you know he's gonna change his mind, or you know that it's it's disturbing in a good way. Yeah. Or you know, yeah, or you know he's wrong. Yeah, yeah, Cause... which which is a good feeling too sometimes to. Uh, to uh, feel like you're, you know, to have this, feel a bit pretentious and have this, you yeah. feel like we you know that the song is good. We have a friend, we always tell him, yeah, Lipe. He was like, ah, it's not a good song. It was 1901. We are so proud of it. We, and we always make jokes out of him. <laughs> and he, play, he didn't like it? No, he didn't like it. But uh, but even music. We love the fact it's so, so important mm-hmm. to have friends like this, you know, who tell exactly the truth, you know. Well, he, their truth. He he was wrong. He was wrong. He was wrong. <laughs> it's, it's a but in song. a way he was right because he, now he likes it, you know. Mm-hmm. So all uh, yeah, all the my fa- uh, first my Lady Valentine again. Mm-hmm. My brother he made me listen, I didn't like it. I was like, What's this? Mm-hmm. But after one night I thought about it and I I really listened and then I got it, you know, and mm-hmm. then I was hooked. Mm-hmm. It takes some time. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you guys about music and about art today. And thank you for the record. And thanks for bringing in the supper table. Yeah, (laughs) anytime. (laughs) Let's have dinner now.